Memory Transcription Subject, UN Secretary General Elias Meyer. Date, Standardized Human Time, October 18, 2136. After bidding farewell to the Arxer commander, I made my way to the conference hall. This hotel was once a primary site for technological conventions, expensive weddings, and even celebrity events. Now, while the catering and decor was missing, it was still a lavish enough venue to field a call to the Zerulians. My headquarters on Earth probably didn't exist anymore, the government needed a temporary base of operations. Secretary Kemper extended invitations to every world leader. With the option to attend virtually, many would be unable to procure space transportation, while others wouldn't want to leave during a crisis. Sir, the Zerulian ambassador is waiting on a secure channel, Kemper offered. I straightened my posture. Good. Patch him through. The adorable face that appeared on screen was enough to soften my demeanor. Shosen's brown fur looked fluffy as a cloud and remained just as shaggy around his cub-like ears. The side-facing eyes made him look like an anxious teddy bear. I suspected that visage would fill most humans with the urge to scoop them up and hug them. The Zerulian narrowed his eyes. I stifled a giggle at how stern he was trying to look, the expression was almost comical. That would be an inappropriate reaction, given how they felt about the Arxer's arrival. It would be preferable to keep these cute aliens as allies. This is Secretary General Meyer. Thank you for taking our call, and for your timely assistance, I offered. I am sorry for what happened to Earth. Chow Sun pawed at his nose, a forlorn twinkle in his eyes. But, my colleagues and I have some concerns. I believe you didn't invite the Arxer, but you haven't tried to push them away. The consequences of aggravating the Greys would be severe and inadvisable with our current readiness. Candidly, we need the help. There isn't exactly an outpouring of aid from the galactic community. The Zerulian began licking his paw, which his species did when thinking. The absent-minded grooming was distracting. I couldn't stop my lips from curving up, despite knowing it was a hostile gesture to their brains. The cuteness was melting away even my practiced composure. There is something amusing about not having aid for your planet, Mr. Meyer? Chow Sun Yip. I shook my head quickly. No, not at all, Ambassador. My apologies. Right. I've talked the Zerulian commanders into writing a more favorable report. We're going to do our best to neutralize the headlines, but I'd still expect incendiary accusations. I understand, and thank you for trusting us. It wouldn't surprise me if certain media outlets ran with the predator scheming together narrative. Having the Arxer in our court was the fuel federation factions needed to turn on us. But I didn't care. Humanity was done crawling through mud to appease paranoid bigots. Species were either for us or against us, and they needed to decide which side pronto. In the long run, our Zerulian neighbors looked to be decent friends. I couldn't imagine their fleet's thought process when the Arxer arrived. It would be understandable if they left at the sight of greys and humans fighting side by side. The fact that the quadruped stayed meant it was worth justifying our position. It's the least I could do, Chow Sun purred. We want to help with the rescue efforts, we have thousands of hospital ships in the system you call Proxima Centauri. That's where I am now. Our military may be unimpressive, but our doctors are second to none. Medical assistance would be appreciated, Ambassador. Please, send them at your earliest convenience. My voice took on a pleading lilt, contemplating Earth's desperation. If there's any information you need about human biology, the Venlo data has given us a baseline. But the issue is sending unarmed civilians into an Arxer occupation. I want to help you, but how do I authorize that order? You want me to get rid of the Greys first? Yes, for our safety. Chow Sun, with respect, they haven't attacked a single one of your ships so far. 
I'm sure that the monsters who snack on our cubs have benevolent intentions toward the Zerulian race. I should invite them over for dinner. That's not what I meant. Human lives are. What about our lives? These are good, selfless people. With emergency services down in most metropolitan areas, there was nobody to respond to medical calls. Anyone who suffered a heart attack or sustained serious injuries was on their own. I would prefer Zerulian medics tending to our people, rather than famished Arxer. That said, Isif's forces were the only protection Earth had right now, we needed both of their offerings. As I said, I am unwilling to aggravate the Arxer now, I replied. But I'm confident this commander will not attack your doctors. Chao Sun bared his tiny teeth. You can't be confident enough. The Arxer are not trustworthy, they're sapient-eating fiends. I know. But there are good people on Earth that need your help, and I believe the Greys will stand down if asked. Please, trust my judgment, this one time. Oh, damn it, human. I'll send the medical ships, but if anything happens to them, this is the last Zerulian aid you're getting. We're not expendable. I inwardly cursed this gamble. Thank you. Kemper, please contact the chief hunter. Let him know the inbound fleet are rescue workers and are not to be harmed. The Secretary of Alien Affairs departed with haste. The Zerulian scientist began pacing in a nervous daze as he sent a transmission to his men. Humanity would remember the quadrupeds' heroism for generations, I didn't know how we could thank them enough. A close-knit alliance might form out of this tragedy. What am I going to do about the other friendly diplomats? They show just how much they care for predator lives. A bipedal sapient popped up in front of the camera, as though my thoughts summoned him. His coarse pelt was the tone of a red fox, and his face had some white markings. I racked my brain, identifying him as a yodel. It was all I could do not to launch into a tirade against his inaction. What was Ambassador Lalo doing with Chao Sun? I'm sorry about Earth too, the marsupial barked. Humans have been the only ones that treated us as equals, rather than a charity case. I narrowed my eyes, and forced myself to maintain a level tone. The Zerolians didn't mention we had company. What can I do for you? I just want you to know we do care about what happened to humanity. Stars, I feel stupid saying this out loud. I really wish we could have helped like Chao Sun. Those words are easy to say, aren't they? Why didn't the Yodel raise a claw? The Zerulian ambassador watched in silence, flicking his ears in discomfort. I urged myself to rein in my fury, for his sake. This wasn't a discussion to have in front of our newest allies, holding the bystanders accountable could alienate our neighbors. Lalo averted his gaze. We don't have our own fleet yet to send you, so, ah, I guess we're useless to you. We're the newest uplifts, guess you think we're worthless primitives now too, I mulled over his explanation in silence. That did alter my perspective, if the yodel hadn't developed any military assets to mobilize. It didn't sound like the Federation had done anything more than dump technology in their lap and expect them to figure it out. Perhaps the apologetic sentiment was worth something. Anyhow, I scrounged up millions of volunteers to help you rebuild, the uplift grumbled. We have lots of untapped resources, and it's labor if you want it. We'd need external transport to get to Earth. I'm sorry that my offer is so underwhelming. I raised my hands in reassurance. We would love any help you're willing to extend. Aid doesn't have to come in a military form, Lalo. Maybe we can teach you a thing or two about our engineering. Really? You would do that? Of course. We're still new to Federation technology ourselves. The two of US can figure out their secrets together. The Yodel's expression was the image of relief, as he squeezed his eyes shut. I felt sorry for the poor guy, if he was expecting to be rebuked for technological deficiencies. 
Perhaps this exchange was reason enough for me to move the goalposts. Anyone who offered assistance would be in my good graces, whether it was military or not. Some of our allies might have been too scared to fight, which could be fixed. They might have been too far away or didn't have spare military resources. Chao Sun gave the uplift a friendly nudge. You can ask us for help too. I knew I was right to bring you along. I apologize if I snapped at you, Lalo, it's been a difficult 48 hours, I muttered. Have you guys heard anything from the other human allied races? The Zerulian sighed. No, I'm afraid not. I pursed my lips. If no additional species expressed the slightest concern for our predicament, that lessened the possibility of extenuating circumstances. According to my sources, the Maziks and the Sivkits hadn't been partial to us. Maybe the absent races had blamed us for killing their diplomats because of our predatory compulsions. Should I even bother reaching out to any of them? My throat felt dry. Well, I appreciate both of you. Please, keep in touch if you have any concerns. Chao Sun waved a paw. Wait, Meyer. I know now may not be the right time, but there was an idea I'd like to mention at least. Go on. The Zerulians and the Yodel are both interested in a human exposure program, Lalo chimed in. Like you did with the Venlo at first contact. Chao Sun flicked his ears. Obviously, some civilians are going to be sharply exposed with rescue efforts. But I still think it's important to foster understanding and discussion, in a controlled environment. I nodded. We'd be amenable to that idea, though any human candidates will carry emotional baggage after this attack. I'll see what I can do to set that up. Excellent. Take care, Meyer, and let me know our hospital fleet's status regularly. The Zerulian terminated the call, and I flopped down on a chair with exhaustion. Human participation in an exchange program shouldn't be an issue, given how cute our helpers were. A few friends in the galaxy was a silver lining. The future ahead of us was going to be rife with war and suffering, we needed to maintain some positive relations to stay sane. I fished out my holopad, and contemplated the address I was live streaming tonight. My original speech was mired with blame and bitterness, focused on revenge. There was room for such sentiment, but that was also how the Arxer ended up with such a warped ideology. What humanity needed was hope. The first words spilled from my fingers in a burst of inspiration. To the people of planet Earth, who have been preyed upon by an unreasonable enemy. I know you are grieving the innocent blood that has been spilled this week. You feel hurt and anger, for the loved ones taken away too soon. I share every scrap of your pain. What I want you to know is that humanity will endure, and that we are not alone. Not only do we have each other, but we have friends who stand with us. The Zerulians and the Venmal fought with us, and gave us back a sliver of optimism for a better life among the stars. It is time to unite with everyone who believes in our ideals, to stand as a single species with a single purpose. Together, we will go for the Federation's throat, relentless in the face of injustice. We will bring our enemies and our persecutors to their knees, if it takes millennia to rectify this vendetta. Humanity calls for atonement, for our right to exist. When we are done, the galaxy shall know what a hunter is. My lips curved up with malice. The speech required some tweaking, but it carried the suitable degree of vengefulness. Governor Tarva would be relieved that I tempered the prior message down a notch. If humanity could unify for the purpose of destruction, then the Federation would have a genuine reason to fear us. There would be a reckoning for Earth, and I didn't know that their organization would survive it. Memory Transcription Subject, Captain Cal Sim, Crockett Alliance Command. Date, Standardized Human Time, October 18, 2136. Darkness had fallen over the reserve when I peeked out from the tent. Sleep had instilled new energy in my veins. There was a slim hope of escaping Earth if we could keep away from human search parties. 
Our posse needed to figure out our next move and how to transport the predator kid without harming it. A muffled whine echoed from behind me. I twisted around to see Arjun, bound in tight rope from head to toe. It must have woken before me and been struggling to break free. Several layers of tape had been slapped over its mouth, wasting medical gauze. I assumed Zarin didn't want to hear a human speak. Swallowing my nerves, I approached it. Shoo, it's okay. I'm going to have to rip the tape off. Close your eyes. How could Dr. Zarn treat it like a thoughtless animal? Predators or not, humans were feeling sapience. The level of bindings was both excessive and unnecessary. Something as simple as tying a bell around its leg would suffice, it didn't seem fast or stealthy. The predator child squeezed its eyes shut. I yanked the adhesive off as quickly as I could and winced at the grimace on its features. The skin by its lip carried a red patch behind. The creature refrained from biting me with its slobbery canines, which was a relief. I set to work untangling the series of knots. What happened if Arjun tried to take me by surprise, once it was loose? It could go for my gun before I knew what hit me. I was within grappling distance, and its reflexes must be quicker than mine. The last of the rope came untangled, and the human wriggled out of its entrapments. My gaze drifted to my sidearm. I took a few steps back and barely resisted the urge to draw a weapon. The kid had faced enough hardship these past few days, it needed someone to be civilized to it. The watery look in its eyes, the poor thing is terrified. There's no question these wretches have feelings. I'm sorry that they did that to you, Arjun. Are you okay? I asked gently. It sniffled. The only reason you're not killing me is because you think they'll trade resources for me. I heard how you talked about me. That stopped Zarn and Jayla from shooting you, didn't it? I would have let you go. Trust me, I want to get you back to your family safely. That's bullshit. Those two aliens are evil. If you want me released, then help me get out of here. I was beginning to regret taking the tape off this thing's mouth. That combative shouting wasn't helping anyone. It needed to keep its voice down, or Zarn would realize I was trying to console a human. However, expecting an aggressive predator to keep its head was a bit overambitious. Holding this child to crocodile sensibility standards would be unfair. I need the doctor cooperating. My feathers puffed out with irritation. My friend with the bandages will die without him. He's a good person, smart, witty. The predator bared its teeth. None of you are good people. You killed millions indiscriminately, and you liked it. You don't know what you're talking about. I had to choose between hundreds of civilizations and yours. It was a terrible decision, but a necessity for the continuance of life. Every step of the way, I tried to minimize human suffering. By dropping bombs on cities? Do you hear yourself? To the very last moment we approached Earth, I was trying to think of another way. My own crew hates that I treat your kind with dignity and that I offer predators surrender. Then your crew are assholes. Arjun's voice sounded hoarse and its lips looked dry. How had Zarn expected it to drink water with its mouth taped shut? The tack can doctor hadn't even left rations nearby. It probably would make that hateful expert giddy if it died of dehydration. I fished through my own rations, making sure never to turn my back on the human. It would be foolish to leave myself vulnerable to pouncing or strangulation. The child watched with interest as I procured a canteen. It gulped down a bit more than I'd like, before handing the canister back. Jayla is the other crocodile you saw. Her brain doesn't feel empathy or fear, I said. She can't help that she's vicious, any more than you can. In fact, Arjun is much more capable of compassion. It has tried to appeal to my morality several times. It cares for more than its own life. The beast scowled. Humans are not vicious. 
You're brainwashed, Kalsim. We have lives, families, schools, jokes, songs, and games, just like you. I am sorry for all the beauty you've lost, but that doesn't change the truth. Tell me that you can't see humans killing or enslaving weaker cultures. That you wouldn't happily take our worlds away and reduce us to playthings. What? That's not our plan. We would never do that. Yet you've done these things to your own kind. And we are alien, not human. You'll build your empire off our backs, one way or another. It's in your DNA, passed from your ancestors to little ones like you. That, your growth is the threat. Arjun clenched its fists in indignation, but was distracted by its stomach growling. Racking my brain, I tried to recall what Noah shared about human needs. The speaker claimed that their diet was primarily vegetation, and that they could live without meat. That meant this adolescent could consume our food without issue. My talons retrieved a slab of dried tree bark. Here. Stop arguing with me and eat this. Um, that doesn't look like my food. Arjun eyed the offering suspiciously. It took a hesitant nibble, then spit the bite out. That is bitter, gross. I'm giving you my ration so you don't starve. It doesn't have to taste like your delectable, blood-filled cuisine. The kid made a disgusted face, but swallowed several bites. The gagging sound it made seemed rather dramatic. You'd think it was expelling its lungs, or that I had fed it a corrosive poison. This ruckus was going to ensure Zarn and Jayla checked on us. Few crocodile would have gone out of their way to ensure a predator's welfare. Arjun didn't understand why its planet was attacked, but I didn't blame it for that. It was emotionally distressed, and unable to see these matters with objectivity. Maybe the youth would come to know that I protected it, in time. The Tak Ken doctor sauntered in, wielding a pistol. Good grief, Kalsim. You've let it loose, and you're feeding it. Tree bark. We don't want it to lose its mind and gorge on Thion's corpse, I said. Speaking of which, where is the first officer? Don't change the fucking subject. So now, instead of being bartered for supplies, this human is using up precious resources and manpower? It's a temporary loss. We don't want to offer up the kid as a walking skeleton. Why the hell not? If you keep its stomach empty, the humans will be under more of a time constraint to get it back. That's assuming predators care at all. Arjun shoved the last of the bark in its mouth, inching away from Zarn. Its cheeks were tear-stained, but absolute hatred shone in its pupils as well. I couldn't imagine how overwhelming the predatory chemicals flowing through its veins were. The doctor's lack of compassion was staggering, with how cold his suggestion of starvation was, you would think he had Jayla's disorder. I fixed the tack can with a glare. First off, we would encourage the humans to treat us the same in kind. This predator doesn't deserve to suffer for existing. It has suffered enough pain and heartache today. The physician swished his tail. You're oh so worried about its feigned emotions. Why do you care what it feels? Fuck you. I'm not in it, the human growled. Zarn charged the kid, rearing back with his firearm. The doctor trembled with anger as he swung the gun toward its head. The predator's binocular gaze widened in alarm. I couldn't let it be beaten to a pulp for speaking its mind when all it had done was complain about our language. Arjun had a family in a future out there which was jeopardized by the Takan's malice. The more I considered our conversation, its intelligence was impressive for a child. Granted, it would help propagate the survival of the human race. But that seemed a likely probability no matter what, so what did harming it achieve? I don't want to see it in pain, or worse, end up like Thion. Without realizing I had moved, I stretched my wing in the strike's path. Zarn was committed to the blow by the time I obstructed his angle. The metal gun connected with my soft tissue, while the human cowered behind a feathery shield. 
Pain flared down my left appendage, resonating to the bone. The throbbing sensation was nauseating, and a single glance told me it was broken. Shit! You broke my wing, I screeched, doubling over in anguish. What if that had been Arjun's head? You could have cracked his skull. The doctor leveled his gun barrel at me. His? My eyes widened, as I realized my slip of the tongue. I shook my head, trying to filter away any positive assessments of Arjun. The kid was lying prone on the floor, and its eyes were bulging. If their tools and pack were taken away, humans weren't competent predators. I was the only one that could protect this beast. Zarn's concentration waned, as a squawking Jayla landed behind him. I took the opportunity to wrench the gun from his grip with my good wing. Ironically, I could use his services to patch the broken bone up. The pain intensified with the slightest movements or vibrations, the Tatkan hadn't even flinched at assaulting me. I brandished the firearm awkwardly. Mutiny is punishable by death, unless the captain is deemed unfit for command. Why shouldn't I carry out your sentence? Cal Sim, P put the gun down, the doctor stammered. You're being unreasonable. I am unreasonable. Then what omnishtal do I call you? Jayla issued a hearty laugh. What did I miss? The female crocodile's eyes darted behind him, and she drew her own firearm. Arjun had capitalized on the chaos, making a break for the exit. The human skidded to a halt, once the armed sociopath blocked its path. After witnessing how slippery Terran forces were, I really should have been paying more attention to it. I hope Jayla doesn't make any hasty decisions here. Zarn proved himself a threat to crew safety and this mission. I lowered the pistol and noted the contempt in the doctor's eyes. But he's not going to disobey orders again, is he? The tack can sighed. No, sir. Your wing isn't supposed to bend like that, Calsim, Jayla chuckled. I struggled to ignore the searing pain. Tell me something I don't know, ah, go on, laugh at my misfortune later. Is there something you need? I circled the perimeter from the skies and spotted a human a few clicks away. It's heading toward our position, and it's armed. Arjun mustered a feral snarl. Dad. Panic swelled in my chest at the thought of Terrans converging on our position. Confronting Arjun's father was an option, but we didn't know that it was alone. The photographer might notice that something was wrong and alert authorities. Humans were dangerous without the element of surprise, it was unclear whether our small posse could survive direct combat. It would be in our best interest to leave the kid, and that was what my conscience demanded. However, that plan wouldn't be popular with my companions. With a crippled wing, taking on Jayla and Zarn was an incredible risk. Both could aim guns without difficulty, and a flight-worthy crocodile could maneuver freely. More importantly, the doctor's incapacitation would damn Thion. That was the main reason I couldn't punish this mutiny. The Farsal's life took precedence over Arjun's welfare, plain and simple. I had to keep this together until Thion regained consciousness. It's time to move, I decided. Where is your patient, Zarn? The doctor scowled. Thion is safe. Jayla crafted a pulley system and put him up in a nearby tree. Predators won't get to him there, though I can't speak for humans finding him. Good. We need to hurry, before dozens of full-grown beasts descend on us. We'll come back as soon as human activity cools off. Jayla began collecting our supplies, as well as anything Arjun had that was useful. I steered the kid out into the open, trying to be gentle with my gun prodding. Intimidating it wasn't my desire, but we needed to move quickly. There was no time for a diplomatic approach. Arjun looked around in desperation as we staggered out of the encampment. I knew it wanted to be rescued. That pleading gaze reminded me of the burning pups, praying to be saved from their extermination. Why did it have to jog up those memories, with every expression? 
I thought I was past that guilt. Dad. Help, the kid screamed. There. I clapped my good wing over its mouth. You idiot. Are you trying to get yourself killed? Zarn passed me a roll of medical gauze, a conceited glint in his eyes. I could hear the words. Told you so, from the smug doctor. He scowled at the human, tracing a toe over his own throat slowly. The child swallowed, and I suppose it understood the gesture. I applied a single layer of tape, and offered a sympathetic pat. The predator hadn't left much choice other than to gag it. Not only could that wailing cry have alerted its father, but it could have drawn attention from forest beasts. That squashed all hopes of Arjun's guardian accepting the disappearance as a tragic accident. Its suspicions were going to be elevated, and its protective instincts would seek answers. Our entourage was about to find out exactly how good humans were at tracking. Memory Transcription Subject, Captain Cal Sim, Crockett Alliance Command. Date, Standardized Human Time, October 18, 2136. The leafy ground crunched underfoot as we steered the Terran prisoner across the park. I was certain Arjun was purposefully stomping on brittle patches. The kid wanted to make as much noise as possible in an attempt to summon others of its kind. It didn't matter how much of a ruckus it made or if it dragged its feet. With how slow humans plodded along, we had at least an hour of walking between us and the returning father. It would tire after sustained exertion and be forced to retrieve a vehicle to close that distance. That left time to snack and hydrate. I ambled along on weary legs. How do you land animals walk everywhere? I wish I still could fly, Zarn. And I wish I could exsanguinate that thing of yours. It would die in minutes if I sliced that big artery on its neck, the doctor muttered. Jayla chuckled. Do you think its eyes would stay open after we axed its head? Or maybe they would pop right out of its skull. We're not killing it. I snapped. Life, even tainted life, is sacred. True exterminators do not kill for fun or for laughs. Zarn pulled a scalpel from his bag and inspected the reflective metal. The tack can must be considering how it would slice through predator skin. I wondered why he hated humans when his species government voted to be their allies. What left him so certain that social hunters had no emotions or benefits? I tried to focus on our travels, knowing we couldn't rest before our June's father did. The kid's skin was damp, but the strain to its breathing was minimal. We had been walking in the afternoon heat for an hour, and its legs weren't fully grown. It should be panting and stumbling with exhaustion. What regiment has this human hatchling been through? Its little lungs must be on fire. We need to rest, for its sake, soon. Additionally, there had been a surprising lack of predator sightings in the forest environment. Something must have picked up our scent by now, but none of them had investigated further. Did other hunters fear the apex humans? The primates shouldn't scare wild beasts with their unimpressive forms. MMM. KMSM. Arjun jerked backward and howled against the tape. Hmm. I cursed as the kid clipped my broken wing. Did I tell you to stop walking? Air, I mean, we'll rest in a few minutes, you're almost there. It continued screaming beneath the gag, and its binocular eyes were almost hysterical. If something frightened a predator, that gave me pause. There must be a reason it refused to walk, unless this was a time-wasting trick. The fear looked strikingly real though, so I was inclined to believe the antics. A blood-curdling hiss permeated the air, and movement flashed across the leafy ground. A brown creature uncoiled its scaly body, lifting its head toward us. A forked tongue waggled from its mouth like a seesaw. The way it slithered forward was alien and unnerving, there were no legs that I could see. That's a prey animal, it has side-facing eyes, I decided. The poor thing must be trying to scare off the predator, flattening its neck like that. I can't believe that works on a sapient human. 
The alarm in Arjun's gaze intensified, and beads of sweat surfaced on its skin. We would have stepped on the reptile if the kid hadn't flailed about. Why was it so terrified of a crippled animal? The tiger's bite was much more petrifying than this thing. The human seemed to forget about the gun to its back and bolted away with impossible energy. That mad dash reminded me of Federation species in a mindless stampede. Maybe these frail primates incorporated some prey instincts into their hardware to compensate for their weakness. Jayla lined up her gun barrel. Better learn how to fly real quick, Arjun. My eyes widened. Don't shoot it. You're no fun. I'm not just letting that scrawny beast go. The sociopath was airborne before I could stop her and bore down on Arjun with powerful flaps. She swiped her talons across its shoulder, carving twin gashes into its flesh. The human yelped. It lost its balance from the blow and toppled to the ground. Jayla's takeoff aggravated the hissing animal, which hadn't blinked a single time. Shouldn't it calm down now that the predator was gone? Zarn seemed to feel bad for it, since the sight of Arjun had traumatized it. He wanted to show it we weren't like the humans. The doctor reached out to give it a comforting pat. Nobody's going to hunt you, sweetie. Did those nasty apes eat your babies? I. The panicked animal was still in fending off predators mode. It was worked up in a frenzy, desperate and aggressive to any movements. Zarn was oblivious to the opening of its mouth. It bit the doctor with tiny teeth, and he grabbed his arm in pain. My gun was readied within a second, and I dispatched a shot through its head. I cursed the tack can for making me shoot a non-sapient victim to Terran incursions. To make matters worse, any nearby humans would hear that reverberation. You had to try to touch a terrified, helpless prey animal, I sighed. Zarn inspected the two tiny puncture marks. I just wanted to soothe it, Calcim. Let me disinfect the wound. Barely a scratch. My pupils swiveled toward Arjun, who had ripped the tape off its own mouth. Jayla was looming over it, and pecked at its earlobe to draw a reaction. I rushed over to intervene, pushing the female crocodile away from the downed kid. My curiosity demanded an explanation for the freakout. That was irresponsible of you to run off. You startled that poor animal, I grumbled. All that panic, for a rudimentary threat display? Arjun gawked at the marks on Zarn's gray skin. The snake bit you? Listen Kalsim, if you don't get him to a human medic, he's going to die. Painfully. Die? I'm not falling for that, the doctor scoffed. Our species actually knows how to treat infections. We have penicillin too, Dr. Psycho. Do you have no concept of venom? You're going to be paralyzed and unable to breathe, in an hour. It does burn quite a bit, Captain, but I have painkillers. Besides, if I was actually poisoned, this human would want me to die and languish. That's all they're capable of wanting. My eyes narrowed, as Zarn confessed to localized pain. His arm did look rather swollen near the puncture wounds. Then again, a medical professional should recognize the signs of blood poisoning. I hoped he wouldn't brush off Arjun's warning just because a human passed it along. We do need to keep moving, urgently. I'll monitor Zarn's symptoms, and if it gets worse, I'll figure something out. Let's get in a few more minutes of walking, and we'll settle down, I said. We can disinfect your wound, and our dunes, incisions. The predator kid flexed its shoulder with a wince. The crimson blood staining its artificial pelt was drying. It pursed its lips like it wanted to argue, but I waved it along at gunpoint. The human shuffled ahead in silence, not wanting the tape reapplied. The tree cover thinned out, and we pressed ahead for several monotonous minutes. I remained on the lookout for snakes, just in case. It didn't make sense why Arjun would help its tormentor. Also, if snakes were really that dangerous and frightening, why hadn't humans exterminated them? Zarn sucked in a sharp breath, 
facial muscles contorting. His pace had begun to lag several steps behind ours. He touched the affected area with the other paw and screamed in a high register. Tears trickled from his eyes. Gah! My bee blood is on fire, he squealed. The tack can slumped against the base of a tree, writhing in agony. Arjun's eyebrows twitched, as though it was in pain itself. Perhaps I had underestimated the scope of human empathy. The best we could hope for, after this failed mission, was that their murders were less sadistic than Arxer hunts. Make it stop. Zarn shriek. Jayla puffed out her feathers. Shut up. You're giving away our location. It hurts so bad. Help me. It's like acid, it's. The female crocodile retrieved the medical tape, and I slapped it out of her grip with the good wing. She wasn't going to shut Zarn up, like an animal, while he was in anguish. Losing the doctor was unacceptable, his services were needed for a fine officer's survival. Arjun knelt on its knee, and coaxed the tack can into a prone position. I knew Zarn was out of it, when he didn't resist the beast's contact. The predator was remarkably gentle with its motions. It showed decency to an enemy that did not deserve it. Just like my officers said I had, where humans were involved. I'm glad I treated their kind with respect. That I didn't make them suffer, and I didn't enjoy their deaths. Cal Sim. We need to get help, Arjun pleaded. The doctor's grip tightened around a grass clump. Get lost, predator. You Jay just want to watch my suffering up close. You're lapping it up. I don't want to watch anyone die. You're the one who wanted to watch humans suffer up close. No. Wounded prey smells good, right? Wait to get your pickings until I'm dead. We never wanted to eat you. I'm a vegetarian. It's part of my religion, to show compassion for animals. My eyes widened at its proclamation. The predator had to be joking. It was Federation religions that dictated that preying on animals was greedy, bloodthirsty, and evil. Natural-born hunters would never follow any ideology that demonized their own existence. How did that make the slightest sense? I thought humans were interesting, Jayla clicked. But they're pathetic, just like everyone else. Cowering in the face of danger, religions about compassion, crying over people that are dead like it's so sad. I glared at her. As I've told you from the beginning, humans have selective empathy. Our knowledge of them is evolving, but their expansionism is incompatible with peace. Don't be fooled, Jayla, they're be brutal. Cunning and manipulative, Zarn gasped. Their history is one of conquest and invasions. Humans cook up new ways to kill each other, always. The doctor howled through gritted teeth as a spasm rippled down the afflicted limb. His pained cry morphed into a full-throated scream. Arjun wordlessly poured some water on the Takan's head, trying to cool his burning skin. Somehow, I trusted the predator not to finish him off, my attention shifted to finding an effective painkiller. Before I realized what was happening, a deafening gunshot echoed behind me. Jayla was hovering over Zarn, a crazed look in her eyes. The physician's body went slack, as blood gushed from his temple. The human gaped as the corpse brushed its leg. I aimed my sidearm at the sociopath. What did you do? Drop your weapon. That's precisely how to shut someone up, she chirped. Enough of your games, Calsim. We do this my way now. Drop. The. Gun. Come on, you hated Zarn. He was making too much noise, the predator said he was going to die anyway. Plus, you would have had us stay here and listen to him scream. This is your last warning. The human is slowing us down too, and it will actively work against us at every turn. I'm doing you a favor. Make your choice, me or Arjun." Jayla swiveled her pistol toward the predator kid, who seemed stunned by Zarn's death. Arjun had never seen a creature die in front of it, 
had it? The words it said about compassion for animals reminded me of my extermination philosophy. We both killed when it was necessary, and contained our damage to the rightful sources. Against all odds, I appreciated this predator's way of life. It was honorable and empathetic enough, not yet lost to its destructive instincts. I had more in common with this prowler than Jayla. There was some attachment to it, to him, in that I didn't want to watch him die in front of me. I squeezed the trigger, and a succinct pop indicated a successful shot. Shock flashed in the sociopath's eyes, before her body crashed alongside Zarn's. The gun slipped from my grasp in a daze. Had I really just lost both able-bodied crew in the span of a minute? Arjun scrambled to his feet, scooping up the weapon. He didn't point it at me, for some reason. Blue tack and blood was spattered alongside his own scarlet shade. The little predator flopped down beside the doctor's satchel. You're hurt. We need to tea treat your wounds and find your father, I stammered. The human didn't respond and merely got to work patching up his own injuries. My instincts should have created an uproar over my proximity to an armed predator. However, I couldn't process fear through the shock. This world of death and wilderness, Earth, could not be my reality. I zoned out, staring into the distance. My story would come full circle if it was ended by the predator I chose to spare. Quite a poetic conclusion for turning my back on my occupation. The three Federation castaways could lie unburied in this infested land for all eternity. Thion is unconscious and abandoned in this predatory hell. Snap out of it, Calsim. There was a slight cracking sound from above, which broke my trance. Before I could glance up, something rough brushed against my throat. The next thing I knew, rope cinched around my throat in a suffocating knot. My body was yanked upward, and I found myself standing on empty space. I instinctively tried to loosen the noose. As my entire mass dangled in its secure embrace, my wings attempted to tread air, searing, all-encompassing pain lanced down the broken bone. Generating lift was impossible. Sun, a thunderous voice barked from above. Get out of here, and call for help. Marcos is looking for these fuckers. How had Arjun's father gotten here so soon? There was no way a human predator could have closed the distance without running. But running that long was impossible, unless their endurance was nigh divine. The kid hadn't tired at all either, oh, sweet Inatala. Arjun palmed his black hair. Tell me you regret what your species did, Kalsim. Please. Regret? Sure, I always did, I croaked. But it was the only way. To secure a future. I did my D-duty. The human youngling watched as my oxygen supply dissipated. His vicious eyes watered. I knew he was thinking about Bengaluru, contemplating how my orders leveled dozens of cities like it. The poor thing never understood the bleak necessity. A constricting pain centered around my larynx, and my field of vision began to diminish. Awareness was receding, like sinking into a vast ocean. Struggling didn't seem important anymore. I felt like I lived a good life, a meaningful one. Cut Calcim down, Dad, please. Arjun's voice sounded as though it came from underwater. He saved my life from the other two, multiple times. I don't want him killed. The adult human growled a reply I didn't register. Its voice was charged with bellowing savagery, a preview of what Arjun would sound like at full maturity. I didn't want to see him transform into an unstable beast, constantly beleaguered by the need to chase. That sickening development was the reason why pups were supposed to be exterminated. The kid offered a plea that was incoherent, as my eyes fluttered shut with grim realization. The rope released its grip, and I plummeted back to the earth with a muted sensation. The little predator poked at my beak, but I couldn't move a muscle. The world faded away, leaving me helpless at the paws of the warlike monsters.